Welcome to video two of Tensor Calculus. Initially, and until further notice, we're going to limit what we do to Euclidean space. Tensor Calculus is applicable to any manifold, but since we haven't yet defined what a manifold is, it makes sense to stick with Euclidean space. For now, suffice it to say that Euclidean space is in fact the most basic and elementary example of a manifold. What we'll discover many videos from now is that with a few adjustments, what works for Euclidean space carries over to other manifolds. So an understanding of how tensor calculus works in Euclidean space is the most logical place to begin. Some other disciplines build up the meaning of Euclidean space from scratch using number theory, vector spaces, group theory, that sort of thing. But with tensor calculus, we take a more common sense approach we begin by assuming that you already understand Euclidean space and go from there. After all, that is the space in which you've lived all your life, so you should be very comfortable working with it. Let's use the graphing software to review some basic characteristics of Euclidean space. We'll start by simply introducing a point. Here is point A, and we'll note that we can move the point forward and backwards, we can move it left and right, or we can move it up and down. And this just reminds us that Euclidean space is three-dimensional. We have three degrees of freedom. Well, we can also add a second point with a segment between them. And this reminds us that uh, we can draw a straight line between any two points in our space, and that the length of the line segment is really just what we mean by the distance between the two points. We also know that we can add another line segment and form an angle between the two segments. We're very familiar with what it means to say that there's an angle between segments AC and AB. Note that this is a three-dimensional concept. It, uh, when the two segments connect with each other, they automatically form a plane, and therefore the angle is valid anywhere in the space just by connecting the two segments. Well, we can also connect points B and C, and we know that we have a way of determining the length of the red segment using the law of cosines. The uh, opposite side length is a function of the adjacent sides and the angle between the two. This is important because this is how we define what we call the metric of the space. It simply tells us how we determine the space, the length, the distance between two points. All right, let me clean this up a little bit. And we will take out the segments and just leave the three points. We know that we can construct a line through any two points like this. And now we have this point B, which is not on the line. And you may remember from your plane geometry courses that uh, we can construct a line through B that is parallel to the one we constructed through points A and C. This, um, uh, we also know that there's only one way to do this. This uh, parallel line is unique. In fact, what we've done here is just to illustrate the well-known fifth postulate that uh, Euclid put forth in his work that said through a point not on a line, there's one and only one line through that point that's parallel to the, the specified line. Now, there are other spaces where that's not true. There are spaces where it's impossible to form a parallel line, and others where you can create effectively more than one parallel line through point B. But in Euclidean spaces, it's only possible to do that one way. All right, we also know that in a Euclidean space, we can create surfaces. We'll start by just doing the simple one, which is to create a plane. 
So I've constructed a plane here that is perpendicular to the line through A and C. And you also know that um, we can create surfaces that are not necessarily flat, such as this um, ellipsoid. And because we can create surfaces in our three-dimensional space, the concept of an area of the surface should be very familiar to you. And of course, you're um, well aware of the concept of a volume of the spaces. Okay, I expect that none of this was new to you. So rather than spend a lot of time on mind-numbing theory, it makes sense to take all this at face value and move ahead. So without proving anything, let's simply summarize the properties of Euclidean space. Euclidean space has the following properties. There is no preferred origin. We say that the space is homogeneous. That means the same everywhere. There's no preferred direction. We say the space is isotropic. There's no specific way to define a point at infinity. Euclidean space is flat. Euclidean space is linear. Euclidean space is continuous, meaning differentiable. That just means that uh, the values from point to point change smoothly and they don't have any sharp edges or joints or fold or cross each other in any way. And the metric that defines the distance between any two points P and Q is given by the formula you see here, which is just a vector notation for what's equivalent to the law of cosines. As I said earlier, Euclidean in space is the most elementary example of an n-dimensional manifold. Non-Euclidean manifolds are similar, but more general in nature. For example, they don't have to be flat and linear. And they may be governed by different metric rules. OK, let's move on to talk about scalars, vectors, and tensors. Scalars are nothing but real numbers. They represent quantifiable entities that do not have any directional significance. Examples of things we can use scalars for are measures like temperature, mass, pressure, density, and so on. Notice that in each of these cases, there's no sense in which one direction is preferred over the other. They're just general real number values. Now, vectors, on the other hand, are geometric objects that include both magnitude and direction. Vectors can be used as directed line segments Directed line segments would um, be something that is uh, used perhaps as a position vector, where we put the tail of a vector on the origin, and the point of the vector uh, is located at whatever point of reference we have. It, it could be a directed line segment between two points, in um, which case we'd refer to it as a displacement vector. But vectors are not necessarily just about measuring links. They're not just... Uh, directed line segments, they are used to represent quantities and, and elements in the world around us that cannot be represented simply by magnitude. Examples would be velocity or acceleration or force. These are not measures of distance, but there is a magnitude associated with each one, and it's uh, something that direction matters. Velocity is just not how fast you're going, but what direction are you going in? And what is the direction of your acceleration as well as the magnitude of it? So there are a multitude of examples where vectors come into play. Well, you've already seen this in a previous demo that vectors can be decomposed into coordinate components for analytical purposes. You'll remember this diagram from the first video where we decomposed vector A and vector B into X and Y components respectively. Now, we decompose vectors to make them easier to work with. But we have to remember one very important thing, and that is that the decomposition process is unique to each coordinate system. 
when you decompose vectors into coordinate components, those coordinate components will be different depending on which con uh, coordinate system you choose to work with. However, there is something that um, does remain common, and it's this, that regardless of the coordinate system used, decomposition of any n-dimensional manifold requires n components. So if we're working with a three-dimensional Euclidean space, no matter what coordinate system we use to represent the vector in, we're always going to have to decompose it into three different components. And as I say, they can look vastly different, but there will always be three components. All that having been said, we must remain aware of the fact that vectors are not their components. They are invariant geometric objects. The components are just things that appear once we plug in a coordinate system for the convenience of working with it, but the vector itself remains an invariant object inside the space. Well, that leads us to the topic of tensors. Now, a tensor is a larger class of geometric objects that includes both scalars and vectors. Scalars are tensors of rank 0, and vectors are tensors of rank 1. Tensors may also have any rank from 0 to r, where r is a non-negative number. We can go as high as we want to, as long as r is an integer. can't be negative. Well, like vectors, tensors are geometric objects. They exist in and of themselves inside the space. But they, too, can be decomposed into coordinate components. However, in any n-dimensional manifold, a tensor of rank r will consist of n to the r power components. So, for example, if we're dealing with a three-dimensional Euclidean space, a scalar, which is rank 0, has 3 to the 0 components, or just 1. A vector will have 3 to the first power components, or 3. A second rank tensor will have 9 components. A third rank tensor will have 27 components, and so on. Here's a little historical reference for tensors. They were first employed while analyzing the structural forces of shear, stress, and compression. You see a diagram here where, in order to properly analyze these forces in a material substance, we need nine different components. Thus, we represent this with a second rank tensor. Well, tensor is of Latin origin. It comes from a word that means to tense. Thus, a tensor is something or someone that tenses. Well, since the original origin, uh, we found that tensors are quite valuable in a number of fields of science. They are useful in fluid mechanics, moment of inertia, electrodynamics, general relativity, and many more applications. All right, we'll call it quits for this video. Next time, we'll introduce the concept of tensor fields.